for, for joining us. Um, so yeah, once again, I'm Brian Taylor with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. I'm the uh, educator with the organization. So um, as we do more uh, electronic education programs, this certainly fits right in. So, so thanks for joining us. Um, go ahead, Sam, you can go to the next slide. Whoops. All right, so just a real quick about um, the watershed, the North and South River watershed area. This is just a, a map of our uh, program area in the green, as well as the actual physical watershed area in the blue. So you can see it encompasses several towns within the South Shore, um, 73,000 acres, roughly 114 square miles. So this is our 50th anniversary. Uh, as you probably all know, we are a uh, little grassroots conservation nonprofit, and um, we are excited to be celebrating our 50th uh, this year. So um, just a little a little bit about our organization there. Um, but so you can mention that we're a membership organization, so um, we rely upon your donations to continue to provide this educational programming. Um, and uh, we're actually pretty big. We're about 1,700 members. So we're a large voice for protecting water here on the South Shore. All right, so uh, there are three big issues that we are always facing that the watershed works to um, uh, find solutions for and to um, uh, work with. So these three issues are, of course, dams that prevent fish, fish passage. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with a dam in and around uh, your town that is there, whether it has a purpose or not. Um, another issue is water withdrawals, that our streams are drying up. And of course, that's a pretty prevalent thing right now that it's been so dry lately. Uh, water levels are, are already down a little bit uh, more than they should be at this time of year. Um, so certainly a prevalent issue right now. And then another issue is storm water pollution. Now these are three major issues uh, that the watershed is always working uh, to solve, but obviously there are more issues, but these are the three big ones. Um, now uh, with these three, two of which, uh, water withdrawals and stormwater pollution can be directly um, uh, helped by rain gardens. So that's why rain gardens fit very well with what we're, uh, our mission and what we're trying to help prevent. So, Sam, you can go into to the next one. All right, so obviously when talking about some of these issues, climate definitely comes up. And uh, when it comes to projected scientific, uh, uh, scientific projections, we're gonna see uh, more floods or, and drier dries. So wetter wets and drier dries is what they are saying. Um, rain will come less frequently, but when it does come, it'll come with a higher intensity. Uh, and of course, rain gardens would be a great way to help combat this there at your own home, uh, on your own property. So uh, that's what, one thing that we'll take a look at. So go ahead, go ahead, Sam. All right. So when water withdrawals, when we're absorbing too much water out of the ground, uh, when we're pumping too much for use, uh, we can have streams start to dry up. And of course, not only can this be bad for our own water usage because our aquifers are drying up, our streams are drying up, but also this affects the uh, animals, uh, the species that need that water as well. So um, it, it can hurt uh, uh, multiple areas, both people and the animals that need these, this water to survive and to live in. There's a few examples of around town. All right, go ahead, Sam. Mm -hmm. This is just a little graphic of how that works when we're pumping too much water out of a aquifer. The recharge rate uh, may not be enough to, um, to fill it back up or to keep it at a consistent level and we start to see this depression uh, where the water is being absorbed from. So uh, you can see in this graphic the stream, the stream isn't, it's, only, it's still there, but if we were to continue pumping more and more, that aquifer would lower and lower and thus the stream would lower as well. So it's not surface water and groundwater aren't separate. They are both connected. And when one area is affected, the other one can show it as well. So it's all one water, which is a really good point to think about when we're talking about this and, and rain gardens. All right. Um, a, little, a little caveat to that is that in the summertime, one of the biggest drain, uh, drainages of water is um, sprinklers on lawns uh, in, in um, 
residential homes. So another great reason to, uh, to be listening in to think about rain gardens. All right, so stormwater runoff, another big issue in the watershed, uh, rain and snow that is not absorbed by plants and soil that travels across the land to the nearest water body. So when we see it rain, we see stormwater happening all the time. It travels across all these impervious surfaces. So roads, parking lots, lawns with grass are also considered impervious because they're so hard packed. Water has a tendency to pool up on top of them rather than soaking into the soil like it needs to. So even a lawn uh, can have a detrimental effect when it comes to managing stormwater uh, and, and um, uh, our groundwater as well. So stormwater runoff runs off the cross the top of the land, collecting all that it, it <laughs> washes uh, uh, with it. So um, a major concern in our watershed as well as every other watershed. Um, runoff from residential areas causes, um, uh, it can contain excess fertilizers, pesticides, trash oil, animal, and yard waste. And all that adds up in great quantity, uh, especially in residential areas. And then it flows into the nearest water source, uh, our water body, pond, river, stream. Um, when it goes into those, those drainage covers, uh, that doesn't magically go to some filtration center or underground to filter. No, it, it will travel to the nearest um, water source. There's a great example of, of just a, a classic view of a storm drain uh, in around town. So, um, all right. So when it comes to healthy surface waters means healthy water supply. Like I mentioned earlier, it's all one water. The groundwater is not separate from surface water. It's all connected. So our actions on land not only affect the water that's on land, it also affects the water underground, which is where we get the majority of our drinking water from. So um, it's very important that all towns and everyone is, is uh, concerned and wants to help protect and keep their water safe because of course, I'm sure we've all used water before at some point, <laughs> right? <laughs> all right, so rain gardens can help with these issues. Um, so look at those, those happy kids right there. They just built their rain garden. All right, so let's take a look at uh, how a rain garden can help. All right, so why rain gardens? Just as we talked about, they help prevent polluted stormwater from entering our waterways. They help replenish our aquifers, where we get the majority of our drinking water from. Uh, they are easy and inexpensive to install and simple to maintain. Really, once they get established, nature kind of does the work for you. Um, they help control flooding because they actually will absorb a lot of that water rather than letting it run off and become stormwater. Um, they can provide habitat for wildlife um, because they would be a lot of native species or uh, you know, species that grow well in, in these types of climate. Um, they improve water quality because they actually help replenish, they put water back into the aquifers to help that replenish and help that water get naturally filtered like it should and like it needs to do. They're fully customizable and beautiful and a super fun outdoor family project. So if you're looking for something to do with your family, uh, like many of us are, now is a great time um, uh, to, uh, to be thinking about possibly um, updating your your landscaping and putting in a rain garden. I just want to point out as the uh, watershed director, the improvement in water quality that a rain garden provides is one of the highest quality stormwater treatments that we can offer um, because it will actually filter out uh, even bacteria. Whereas many of the other types of treatments that um, engineers install don't necessarily deal with bacteria. And for many of our coastal waters, Bacteria is the uh, pollution that we are trying to minimize so that we can swim and shellfish in our waters. So rain gardens are, are really quite efficient uh, at stormwater treatment. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, the earth is the best natural filter. And, uh, and the also when it comes- themselves, the plants too. Yeah. Because yep. they'll take yep. up the nitrogen, um, which is again, something that many of the other sort of treatments that we might do um, are not capable of doing. That's a great point, yep. Um, and I'm sure some of, of you folks are living or have heard of a pond nearby or a lake or a water body that may have, you know, uh, excess levels of nutrients that might fuel something like an algae bloom. Um, uh, so, you know, that this all can help uh, when it comes to all those other things that can happen when it comes to stormwater and, and pollution. So. All right. I this just is wanna, 
Brian, just before we get going. So now everybody, this is going to be the part where you're going to actually, you know, maybe have questions. So um, people do have questions. Uh, please use your comment and then we'll try to get to them as soon as possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. All right. So rain gardens, they reduce runoff and they recharge groundwater. So um, obviously there's a lot of different ways that you can put yours together. Um, but these are some generally some good rules of thumbs here to um, to to get started and to um, see how you want to go about that. So um, Sam, I can see your um, your <laughs> sorry. Uh, so it's okay. So uh, a rule of thumb is so for whatever size garden you want to do. We'll talk about that in a moment. When it comes to the actual composition of your substrate, your garden, and, and the, your layers two parts sand, one part topsoil, one part compost. So there is an optional gravel layer underneath and that's to help help with the um, natural um, soaking in of the water. And we'll talk about that, what to, what to look for if you need that optional gravel layer or not. And then on top of all this will be a layer of mulch. And the mulch is there um, just as we're used to it, it's to help prevent um, weeds from growing, but also to help maintain a moisture layer because once this garden gets established, this isn't something that you're gonna be having to water, uh, which is one of the great things about it, is that it naturally waters itself when it rains, but also, as I'm sure Britt is gonna talk about, these are some species that can tolerate drier conditions. There are uh, a lot of native species which are used to growing in a uh, natural setting here in New England that does not need watering. So, um, so two parts sand, one part top soil, uh, top soil and one part compost if you have available. So that topsoil and compost can be, you know, if you don't have compost readily available, uh, maybe consider starting a compost of your own, but, but also you can add, you can make it two and two uh, to just get that nice, you know, mixture of, of good loamy, um, healthy, fertile soil to get your plants started. All right. So where should we build uh, the rain garden and how to build it? So Picking a location, you want to be at least 10 feet away from a building, um, foundation, or any underground utilities. You don't want to be over a septic system, drainage field, or leach field. Um, you want to look for an area where water is, uh, tends to pool up during storms. Now, I know it's probably been forever since we've seen rain. So when it does, or maybe you know about a spot in your lawn where water will, has, has a tendency to, uh, will have a tendency to, to pool up, that might be an area that you want to focus your rain garden. However, you do not want to build these at a wetland. You want an area that is not always wet. Um, you want an area that is, uh, fills up or gets saturated with water during a storm, but not a place that is always wet because then a, your, your rain garden might, you know, you obviously don't want to build that on a actual wetland, but also the rain garden is going to operate how it should. It needs to have, you know, absorb all that water and then dry out when it's not raining. Um, otherwise, your, your plants may not survive and all that. So um, and making sure that you're at least 10 feet away from a building foundation is important because you don't want any of that water since you're going to be concentrating flows to a particular area or channeling water to soak into the ground. You don't want that water to then work its way back into your basement or, you know, into your foundation. Um, so that's why you want to have it at least 10 feet away. Um, when it comes to a drainage area, so you want to... Um, uh, divide by the depth of the garden. So calculate the drainage area. Um, there, obviously there's many variables and, and <laughs> these are guidelines, but so for example, um, for, you know, you wanna think about the, the amount of surface area of these places. So like your roof, if you have a roof that is 20 by 20, um, uh, and then you divide that by 10, the depth of your garden, about a 40, squit, a 40 square foot surface area, that would be your drainage area. So we, we've got actually, 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 Brian, let me just kind of, cause I re-edited this after Brian. So let me just make sure people understand this. This is actually to calculate the size of your rain garden. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the rain garden has to be sized to the area that you're trying to um, drain water in, you know, that, that it would be able to capture the water that you're draining into it. So you have to calculate how much of an uh, area that you're going to be draining into it to size it appropriately. And that has a lot of variables to it. Um, so these are sort of rules of thumb. So you can uh, 
take that roof area that you're going to, so if you're going to take a gutter from your roof, uh, you want to look at how much of that roof area is actually going to that gutter, right? Because we have gutters in multiple places along our roof. Um, you want to calculate that impervious size, that drainage area that's going into the gutter. And then you want to take, and say you're going to make a 10 inch uh, deep rain garden. That would mean that you have to size the rain garden to be approximately 40 square feet. Or you can use this handy calculator that I found online, which I think is, um, it, you know, I think is quite good. It's built for Pennsylvania, but it has, um, and I guess I can click to it. I'm not sure how you can see it though. Hold on, let me uh, see if I can share with you that calculator because I thought it was a pretty nifty, um, Hold on just a second, give me a minute to find it on my computer and then share it to you. Uh, hold on just a second. Uh, that's not quite it, is it? Technical challenges, hold on. It out. Um, here it is. Okay, so this is the link that we'll we'll send out this presentation to you all with the different links so that you can have them readily available to you to play with. But this rain garden, which is out of Pennsylvania, had a nice uh, size the garden calculator. And it depends upon uh, how much rainwater you want to capture, what kinds of surface area you have here. You can put how many downspouts, the soil quality, and the slope. And it has this um, recommended uh, amount of water that you would try to um, capture. So I think that this is actually a pretty good way to size your garden because it does vary based upon all of these different um, criteria how much area you're trying to put in, um, what the soil quality is, and the slope, uh, as well as how much rain you're trying to capture. Ideally, you'd want to capture at least the first inch, because that will actually reduce the um, pollution. Um, that's where most of the pollution comes through. Um, so I think that that is a helpful. I'm going to go back to the presentation. I think the challenge I have, Brian, is when I do the presentation, I can't see the chat. So I can't, I can't figure out how to help people. Give me a second here. Let me go back to the, to the chat function. Okay, so Jean Foy asked, what type of issues would you see if the garden is too small or too big? Well, um, typically, you know, we see if you do this correctly, drainage, you should be able to have the water go through the soil um, adequately. So, um, you know, if you're talking about like a, a major redesign of your lawn or landscape, you might want to get a professional to help you if you're worried about real flooding. But I think if you're just trying to capture some roof runoff or um, sort of mitigate uh, some wet spots in your yard, you, you shouldn't have any trouble once you put in the right soil mixture to drain. Um, and so we'll also talk a little bit about um, testing the drainage characteristics of your soil. So and then another person asked, the previous slide recommended two feet layer of sand or topsoil. If we did that, would we divide by 24 inches, or is 10 inches the amount of water that can be absorbed with the most specs? So again, um, the variable, the depth is variable based on how much water, and that's why I like that calculator, because you can play with that a little bit. Um, and we've never, um, when we've built rain gardens, and we've done it with schools and with uh, rec departments and all sorts of different places, you know, it's, it's really, again, a rule of thumb. Um, kind of thing. And the, the biggest thing to be concerned about is making sure that you test that soil to make sure that it can drain. If you have clay soils, um, you know, you're going to need to have it be deeper 
and have it be more gravel in order for things to work. So, so I've seen, we've done much deeper rain gardens and we've also done much shallower rain gardens and never had any real problem with capturing roof runoff. Anything that overflowed, I mean, you know, anything that overflows would overflow naturally onto your lawn, right? So if you've got water coming off of your roof now and it's going down onto um, the lawn and you're not flooding, you're not gonna have anything worse happen by putting in a rain garden. You're gonna only improve a situation by putting uh, better gravel or better soil that's more permeable into that um, rain garden. So hopefully that helps. Okay, let me go back to sharing my screen so Brian can continue on with, ah, good, now I can see the chat, okay, good. Okay, so I'm gonna move on mm -hmm. to this next slide for Brian. All right, um, obviously when we're talking about digging, you definitely want to uh, call dig safe at least 72 hours before digging, especially if you're gonna be using an excavator. Um, um, but, you know, just if it's just a small, um, you know, small little bit that you're digging, you know, obviously use your best judgment, but please do be safe, um, especially if- Yeah, if it's not something that you would have called, you know, dig safe, like if you're out making in your yard and you feel pretty confident and you're not going down more than inches or so, and you're hand digging, you should be able to avoid any kind of uh, utilities underground. But just to be safe, I wanna put this up there for people to know you can do this. Um, you can call and they will come out and make sure to mark your utilities so that you're not, that you're avoiding anything if there's a gas line or anything else mm -hmm. uh, might be in the way. You just wanna be careful. Yep, yep. Um, and the shape is very customizable. It can really be any shape that you want. Generally speaking, you want it sort of a bowl, uh, so that way the water has a tendency to flow towards the middle, reducing the risk of it, you know, like flooding and kind of reaching out of the side. So keep it about six inches lower in the center rather than around the edges. Uh, and obviously definitely be looking out for tree roots. It would be um, kind of counterproductive if you happen to hurt or, or kill a tree trying to dig a hole for your rain garden. So um, do be aware of, of any tree roots around there. And, and if you do come across them, you may want to consider moving it or rerouting the water away from, from that so you can move your rain garden. Um, so when it comes to drainage, obviously drainage is very, very important to have the rain garden be operating the way that it should. And to do this, what you can do is you can dig a six inch hole um, where you, anywhere in where you plan on having your rain garden um, and fill that hole with water and then after 24 hours, if there is still water in that hole, you wanna choose a new location um, because that may be too much. You can, what you can do is you can add a little bit of a gravelly mix uh, for that lower layer of your rain garden underneath the, the uh, topsoil um, to try to help encourage the, uh, a little bit more saturation rate of that water. But uh, if, like Sam said, if you have a lot of clay, um, it uh, may not be the best area for that. Um, you may end up having to remove more soil than, than you would want to deal with, and that just wouldn't be a good situation to be in. So uh, it's very, very important that it, it drains. And so- um, Yeah, I'd like so, to just say to say, it's a lot of this is like making a French. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but similar kind of situation where you, you're gonna create a much more porous volume storage within the, ground. Um, if you have like a major, major flooding issue, this is, you need to maybe have an engineer. So, but if you're, if you're just trying to help the environment, um, this is definitely a good solution to reducing stormwater runoff. That makes sense? Yeah. And then it looks like somebody asked a question. Um, hold on, I'm gonna, does the depth of the rain garden affect the types of plants you need to use? Not really. The most important thing is to think about uh, location, sunny, shady, um, and the type of plants that can sustain uh, wet and dry feet. Um, because it will be, you know, there will be um, times when it's got water in it and then it'll be drained uh, and dry for some period of time. So again, the, I will be talking more about the types of plants with wild ones. Um, Yes, to who, somebody who asked me, we will be sending a copy of the presentation after the meeting, and we are recording this so that it will be available on our YouTube channel. 
And then um, Susan asked me a question about her downspout being inches off of the side of the house at the recommended distance. So usually you can use an extender. Um, in fact, I, I think we'll have an example of one that I'll show you from another uh, rain garden project that we did in Pembroke that was taking roof, rotter, roof runoff, a uh, gutter from a, uh, the town hall, actually. So anyways, carry on, sir, Brian. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, glad that we got questions. Yeah. Um, so we already talked about the soil mixture. Um, and uh, uh, Britt will talk more about the plants. Um, so once again, that two to three inch layer of mulch to help prevent um, uh, weeds and to help retain the moisture for your plants in there, especially when it starts to dry out. Um, one thing to think, you know, some people, uh, don't worry about mosquitoes with this because yes, sometimes your rain garden may take, um, you know, 12 to you know, 20 hours to, to drain. Um, that is not enough time for mosquitoes to start breeding in there. Uh, that's that's usually you know four plus days um, uh, so so don't worry about mosquitoes as long as your rain garden does um, drain at a at a reasonable rate um, that is one thing that you will not have to worry about all right so um, rain garden care water weed and mulch so when you get this thing started your plants will be needing some uh, water to help them get established uh, so um, you'll want to water every other day for the first two to three weeks until everything gets well established and starts to, um, you know, grow well. Um, so the first year or two may need additional water if it's seasonally dry, like for example, right now. Um, but you'll just have to really be in tune with, with your plants uh, and, and just keep an eye on them and uh, give them some water as needed. So, um, of course, we can talk about sustainable watering uh, at another point, uh, um, but um, uh, so they might just need a little help to get started. Um, Well-established roots will no longer need additional water. And so after that, you know, those first few weeks, especially after that first year, uh, you, you'll probably start to see it, um, start to take um, control of itself and start to operate as it should without any um, additional watering. So. Definitely keep that layer of two, that two to three inch layer of mulch uh, on there. So about one cubic yard of mulch will cover about a hundred square foot with a uh, two to three inch layer. So, um, so that's a, a good little rule of thumb if you're needing to buy some mulch um, and uh, not quite sure where to get started. So, um, and when you're watering or when it rains, the water uh, should drain and not pool up for more than 24 hours, just as you did when you uh, did that first test to so dig that six inch hole, fill it with water, come back the next day and make sure that it has drained out within 24 hours. All right, so this is just a, a little graphic of um, someone's home that they have actually put in, they have a lot of things going on here to help uh, mitigate stormwater runoff. Uh, and uh, so you can see they have a couple rain gardens there. Um, those are, looks like from the picture that they have rerouted a downspout uh, towards one of those uh, rain gardens. They are leaving some natural vegetation like trees around their yard. They have minimal lawn and uh, they have a porous pavement, which is kind of a neat thing because driveways, they're typically slanted in some fashion. Uh, can send a lot of stormwater runoff down to towards the uh, storm drains. Uh, and so a little layer of like porous pavement or gravel or something uh, in and around a driveway can help actually reduce that water running, running off um, the driveway and into a storm drain, mm -hmm. which is then where, of course, it goes into the nearest water source. I just um, want to comment on, on the typical home uh, not newer homes because newer homes have to comply with stormwater um, regulations. But you know, homes that were built in the 50s, um, after World War II in particular, they uh, had storm drains or gutters that would be directed right to the driveway, and then the driveway, of course, slopes to the road, and then the road, um, you know, has its own uh, storm drainage. But um, Really what we need people to do is to disconnect the, that water from going into the road um, and put it and kind of contain it on their own property if possible to reduce 
stormwater pollution and to retain water on site so that it's not being routed essentially right into a stream along with road runoff uh, and polluting our water. So this, um, you know, typically I'll see like gutters that are coming off of a house that I've, have been directed to close to or approximate to or on top of a driveway. So trying to disconnect that connection to our roadways, our public surface roadways would be ideal. So then um, I guess this is a little bit of the tour of different places that um, we've put in some rain gardens. Um, I'm going to share with you guys after this meeting, we'll send you around a, the PDF of this presentation, a link to the YouTube video of it, um, as well as other resources. And one of the resources is a map I made on Google of different rain gardens on the South Shore that the Watershed Association has been involved with um, uh, either making or, or requiring others to make. Um, this actually is a rain garden that we made at the Marshfield Rec Department um, off of uh, Fair Hill. Um, so uh, that there, you can't see it here, but there's actually a, um, a road, we made a swale with uh, almost like a dry river swale from some of the imp impervious surfaces on this site um, so that when the water, when it rains, it drains into that and then into the garden. Um, I can't, honestly, I can't remember the plantings that we put in. Um, many of the rain gardens we've built were built with a grant that we had uh, over 10, 15 years ago. Um, so it would also help us to sort of understand how well these are doing. So if you go for the tour, um, you know, update us as to how things are going um, in these rain gardens. This is, um, this is a rain garden that was built proximate to the Pembroke Town Hall. So this is actually the town hall. This is the roof uh, gutter coming out and then draining in to this rain garden. Uh, you can also put that underground. You don't have to have it showing. Um, you just wanna make sure that the slope is adequate to have the water you know, get away from your foundation, which is what the whole reason of having a gutter is. Um, and, uh, um, you know, these rain gardens, again, were put on a uh, town hall uh, public place that you can go visit, and they're all around the entire town hall. Each roof was uh, directed into these rain gardens. Uh, this is a rain garden I helped build in the hall where I live at the Weir River Estuary Center, and actually it's taking runoff from a major road, um, and uh, you can see the daylily. Um, there's winter berry, I think, in here. Um, we've had a little bit of challenge with this particular one because it is taking direct road runoff. So salt and, um, uh, you know, the good news is it's, it's taking up these things. The bad news is, is, is some of the plants can't sustain it. So we've had to change out some plants. We found the winter berry super uh, resilient to um, the salt and other stuff that's coming off of this road. So um, this is where we're actually treating road runoff because they have zero stormwater treatment on this state road that's literally on top of a river. So um, we're pretty pleased about the fact that it's remediating pollution. Um, and then if you ever go to Target in Hanover, um, you can take a look at the rain gardens that we uh, asked for the engineers to install at this site. Um, you'll see, um, they don't look as nice as this anymore. They've let, unfortunately, like Phragmites and other invasive plants grow in it. Um, but, you know, despite the fact that I don't like the Phragmites and it's not offering a lot of great habitat, it's still providing water quality function um, in terms of removing the grit and grime and other things that are coming off of this. You'll see when you go, you know, plastic bottles, trash in there, obviously uh, the target maintenance staff that it's their job to do that. And if you go to the target and you see them filled with trash, please go talk to the target, uh, you know, staff and ask them to see if they can get their maintenance crews out there to, to remove that trash more often. But what's nice about this is, you know, stormwater is a, what we call a, um, the forgotten, forgotten utility because it's underground, nobody sees it. And when we expose it like this, 
where we can see uh, it removing the pollution, uh, then we hope that it will provide people with a little bit more insight to the fact that they shouldn't be throwing their uh, litter on the ground um, because it does, does gather and uh, is unsightly and not to mention unhealthy in many ways. So, so part of what we're trying to do is to share with people both a technique that helps reduce pollution, puts water back into the ground so we can store it for our summertime use. One good thing about this target I'll mention is that they have uh, cisterns underground. So they actually, uh, we required them to not use, they can't use the public water supply to water their um, plantings. They have uh, cisterns that capture the roof runoff and they store it underground of the target and then pump it back up and use it to water um, when they need to. So that's kind of a, like a big rain barrel essentially. <laughs> Obviously they have a much bigger roof than most of us. Um, but additionally, green garden tips. Um, we are right now, I'm on the state's Water Resources Commission and I'd be remiss if I didn't say to you that we are um, approaching drought levels here and definitely in drought levels in Western and Central Mass. Uh, they're actually being declared a drought uh, level two out in Western and Central Mass. We're seeing extraordinarily low stream flows. Groundwater levels are low. So um, we wanna emphasize to you since I have you that um, kind of green gardening tips and how we can save our water. So really, if you have to water, please do it at dawn. You don't wanna use water or when the sun is out watering, it'll evaporate and it's bad for the plants, it burns them. Um, you wanna water your lawn only when it's thirsty. Of course, right now, everything's thirsty. So I would ask you not to water your lawn and think about the fact that we need our water for firefighting and for drinking. Um, and not to use drinking water quality uh, water to water a lawn. Uh, other things that you can do to help your grass to maintain itself is to mow it with a sharp blade. If you're whacking it with a dull blade, you're ripping and shredding the, the blade of the grass um, and making it sus susceptible to fungus and other um, disease. Leaving your grass clippings on the lawn is a good way to recycle nutrients. Keeping your lawn tall, helps shade out weeding, shade out the weeds. Um, it also means less work and less mowing. Um, as we've discussed, using permeable pavers and porous asphalt if you can, um, creating mini meadows, native trees and shrubs. So um, keeping some of your uh, dead uh, flowers standing, these actually keep, uh, they, they keep giving the gift to uh, nature. Um, and compost, 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 because soil is such a critical, thing uh, in terms of maintaining any landscape. Um, you really want to have healthy, healthy soil and that minimizes any need for fertilization or watering. So if you can make your own compost or buy it and amend your soils, um, you're creating a really rich environment for your plants to hopefully sustain any kind of conditions that they're going to see that are adverse. Um, so that's my uh, sort of and Brian's section, and we'd like to now invite Britt. I'm gonna, I guess, stop my sharing, Britt, and let you um, share your screen to share more about kinds of plants um, that you would recommend that are natives, um, that would do well in rain gardens in our area. And again, for people who have questions, the chat function, um, we'll also take, you know, we can actually talk to each other after the, presentation uh, as well. So go ahead, Britt, take it away. Thank you both so much. That was very informative. And I have, I know where I'm going to put my rain garden. In my <laughs> garden. I'm excited. Um, can you see my screen with the butterfly? Yes. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, we're, we're wild ones. I'm the co-president. Co I moved here from Chicago six years ago. And in the Midwest, Wild Ones is a very big organization. There, there are many chapters. And I moved here and there, uh, there were no chapters in Massachusetts. So I put out on Facebook a request on a garden page. Hey, anyone interested in um, being in a wild ones group and native plants? And the, the, the interest in that was incredible. Um, so we started a chapter and we're growing and we're almost at um, two years uh, in on this project. But like I said, we're basically a, a garden group. And, but we focus solely on native plants and um, 
I'm going to explain a little more on why that is. Okay, so um, so why native plants? So this is from um, the Lady Bird Johnson uh, wildflower website, and basically North American native plants defined as those that existed here without human introduction are disappearing at an alarming rate <clears throat> due to human activities such as urban development, agribusiness, and the introduction of invasive species. That's a big one. Um, the loss of native plant communities has reduced wildlife habitat and the genetic diversity necessary for balanced ecosystems. Unlike many non-native plants, native plants introduced into the landscape plantings are hardy, less susceptible to pests and diseases, and unlikely to escape and become invasive. Um, so my native story started when I bought this house uh, in the Chicago area many years ago. And what I inherited with the house was a sterile lawn and about 200 hostas. Um, and so I started, um, at that point, I thought of plants as kind of decoration. Um, I was, nature was always very important to me, but like as far as what was in my yard was very much to please me, like it was pretty or smelled nice. Um, and then a friend gave me um, several pots from her yard of uh, Black-Eyed Susan, Rudbeckia herta, and I was just kind of amazed at, I didn't have to do anything to take care of them, um, visited by so many butterflies um, and goldfinches coming in the winter to peck at the seeds, like it was just full of life. Um, and so I um, basically planted every, it was a tiny yard, but uh, front and back planted every area of this with native plants. Um, and it was wonderful and hard to leave when, when we moved here. But that was sort of how I started was, I shifted from thinking of plants as decoration for myself to being an integral part of uh, nature and wildlife. And my tiny little Chicago yard could do that. Oh man, let's see, okay. So, um, sorry about that. Okay, so there are three books that I recommend if you're interested in reading more about native plants. And a lot of the statistics I, share in this presentation are from these three. So Native Plants for New England Gardens by Mark Richardson and Dan Jaffe. Um, and they were both part of um, Native Plant Trust out in Framingham, which is a wonderful place to visit if you haven't been. Um, it's uh, essentially a Native Plant Botanical Gardens. Um, and I think they've opened back up um, for visitors. In addition, um, Doug Ptolemy has written um, a many books that are all amazing and fascinating and well written. So this one is Bringing Nature Home um, and then Growing and Propagating Wildflowers by William Kalina. And uh, if you're interested in um, growing anything from seed, that's a lovely, lovely book. Okay, so why use native plants and trees instead of non-native plants? So, and I'm going to go over each of these ideas here in, the, in future slides, but basically it saves water, reduces the time, energy, and pollution of mowing, provides food, nectar, and habitat for birds, butterflies, and other wildlife, helps reduce soil runoff and erosion, and gives us a sense of place. Okay, so um, using native plants saves water. So we have a lot of the similar statistics uh, from you guys that I'll go over real quickly. But the average American family uses 320 gallons of water per day, and a, a huge percent of, percentage of that goes to outdoor uses. Um, so nationwide landscape irrigation is estimated to account for nearly one third of all residential use, totaling nearly 9 billion gallons a day. Um, and for the most part, this is for lawns, which are sterile and really don't do anything um, for anything for the environment other than they're, they're nice to, to walk on and play soccer on. Um, and I often think um, we're so used to having lawns in our life that we, we picture that they look like this when it actually, they usually go dormant. And if you drive around and really look at how lawns look right now, they're not so great. Um, so they definitely have their use. I have kids, um, but if we can take even a little part of our, our yard over with native plants, um, it's a really wonderful thing. Um, so native plants are trees, shrubs, flowers, grasses, ferns, and other plants um that evolved in a region over time so it's perfectly um happy with the amount of rain we get it's perfectly happy with the the heat and the seasons here um this is from my yard um this photo and this is little blue stem mixed with purple coneflower and i don't know if you can see it over on the right here 
But um, so this is little blue stem, the roots of little blue stem, and they go down about six feet into the soil. So I've never had, I think I watered them once or twice when I first planted them. Never have had to do anything since. Um, and then here's purple coneflower, and I think those roots go down five feet. So same thing. I, I actually, um, someone was selling their house and had a, a garden full of purple coneflower they didn't want. I came, I dug them all out, not in pots, just put them in a wheelbarrow. They actually sat there for a day and then I planted them the next day and they're happy and fine. They're very easy. Um, and then if you're looking, if you're trying to find here, if you look quickly and look for the, the Kentucky bluegrass, it's almost hard to see because it's way over in the corner here and it really, um, the roots are extremely shallow. You have to water grass constantly in order for it to stay decent. Okay, so um, using native plants reduces time, energy, and pollution of mowing. Um, so American lawns occupy 30 to 40 million acres of land. Um, lawn mowers to maintain them account for some 5% of the nation's air pollution, probably more in urban areas. Um, and adding to that, the, the leaf blowers and all the things you need to do to, to take care of your lawn. Um, each year, more than 17 million gallons of fuel are spilled during the refilling of lawn and garden equipment, which is more than the, uh, more oil than the Exxon Valdez spilled. Um, and a lawnmower pollutes as much in one hour as 40 automobiles driving, um, because there's really no regulations on the lawnmowers where um, cars are more efficient. You can believe that. Um, and 580 million gallons of gasoline are used in lawnmowers each year. Um, and if people are interested, let's see, whoops, sorry, okay, uh, so here's, um, this, on the left, this is not my picture, this is not my front yard, but this is basically what I'm slowly changing my front yard to, um, and I have mown, um, grass paths that go through, so I try to fit in with the neighbors, because everyone else has, uh, all grass. Um, if someone wants to do something more sustainable than um, a, a traditional turf lawn, there's this Pennsylvania sedge, which is native. Um, and, oh, let's see. So Pennsylvania sedge, it's one of the top plants for pollinators in New England, which I think people don't think of grasses and sedges as being for pollinators, but it's one of the top plants you can plant for pollinators. It hosts dozens of moth and butterfly species, and you can um, you can use it like a traditional turf grass. You can mow it only once a year and it needs no irrigation. Um, I'm sorry, my computer is being a little funny. Okay, uh, so using native plants provides for wildlife. So if we think, this is a little extreme picture, but if we think of the traditional lawn around here. We have a sterile lawn and usually alien um, species. So to, to insects, this is basically uh, sterile. They can't do anything with this. Um, but you, and we're going to talk more about specific plants, but um, plants over time here evolved with the insects um, and they're interdependent. So when we, we plant only alien species, we're, we're taking that away. Okay, so here's, here's where we overlap a lot. So using native plants reduces soil runoff and erosion. So if we're thinking about those plants with those very deep roots, they can suck up all that water. So now if we're pairing that with uh, the rain garden, that's just kind of doubling what we can do. Um, so homeowners, so just a few interesting statistics. Um, homeowners spend billions of dollars and typically use 10 times the amount of pesticide and fertilizers per acre on their lawns as farmers do on conventional crops. So 67 million pounds of pesticides are used on U.S. lawns each year. Um, these chemicals then run off and become a major source of water pollution. So the same thing that you guys talked about. Um, and a same statistics, a typical lawn absorbs only 10% of the amount of stormwater that a natural landscape can absorb. Um, and so we're aiming, uh, both groups, we're aiming to keep rainwater on our property. All right, so this one's one of my favorites. Um, using native plants. Oh, and there's uh, a little bit of a rain garden there. So using native plants gives us a sense of, of place. 
So I um, I went through and searched for um, like begonia gardens because begonias um, generally are, are from South America and areas of Africa. And I was just curious. So I pulled this up from different places. So these are pretty much all non-native species and you would have no idea where in the country where you were if you're looking at this, the Northwest, the Southwest, um, it all just really looks the same. It does not give a sense of place. So instead, if you start thinking about <clears throat> giving a sense of place, right? Southwest. And of course, these are larger plantings, but they're, they're things that are native to these regions and you, you, you feel it. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, so I wanna do just two quick um, things on um, specifics on native versus non-native. So I know a lot of people love um, burning bush. When we moved into our house, we had about 20 in our backyard and we yes. pulled them all out. Um, so burning bush is, an, is a very invasive shrub brought here in the 1860s from Asia. Um, in Massachusetts, it's banned for sale. Um, you can't trade it, you can't plant it, um, it's illegal. And I see all the time on Facebook pages people saying, well, it's not invasive in my yard. Like, I don't have a problem with it. Um, but, whoops, okay. Uh, but here's what happens is the birds, it doesn't really offer much. It's not a host plant for anything. Insects generally don't eat the leaves. Um, it has lovely fall color, but that's really all that's going for it. Um, and birds will eat the berries, which is in theory a good thing, but then the birds go out to the woods and deposit those seeds, which become seedlings, which then take over, take over the woods and they crowd out um, native species that were providing wildlife. So something that looks very similar um, to burning bush and has amazing fall color, um, but is native is blueberry. Um, and there are many plants in this family. Um, high bush blueberry would do really well in a rain garden. Um, low bush blueberry wouldn't, but it's, it's also native. Um, there's also three types of cranberry bushes. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of, um, plants within this family, but this is high bush blueberry. And high bush blueberry um, supports a whole amount, a ton of um, living things, including kids and people. Um, and it's actually the host plant for uh, striped hair streak butterfly, ground elfin butterfly, spring azure butterfly. So a lot of, um, up to 90% of insects are specialists. So they can only survive on plants that they evolved with. So a monarch is kind of our poster child for a specialist. A monarch can only survive, I'm sorry, a monarch caterpillar can only survive on uh, milkweed um, under the genus uh, Asclepius. A monarch butterfly can go and flit around and, and take nectar from other places, but for monarchs to survive, um, they need milkweed. So these um, insects are similar. They need the blueberry to survive. Um, Okay, one more um, that I know people love. I always hear like, where can I buy boxwood? Um, boxwood is non-native. Um, it doesn't really bring much to the landscape. Um, it's, it's decent shelter for animals, um, but it also has somewhat smelly flowers. <laughs> but uh, a native version is uh, inkberry, which you can find at garden centers. It's a very common uh, bush. You can find compact varieties and large varieties. Um, and it's a host plant for Henry's elfin butterfly and adult butterflies attracted to the blooms. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very easy to find. So I don't know, we have this kind of obsession with boxwood, with inkberry is, I think, much more beautiful. It's a little looser look to it. Um, so I highly recommend inkberry. Okay, so I just, um, there's so many native plants. So I just went through and picked 10 plants that I'd recommend for full sun in a rain garden. And then I'll show you 10 plants I'd recommend uh, in part sun and 10 plants in shade. So um, these are all lovely and that's one great reason to plant them. They're easy to care for. They don't really need much um, after you have them established. But one of the lovely things, we talked about the Asclepius being a host for monarchs, right? So here's um, swamp milkweed. It's also sometimes called rose milkweed. And when I say again, it's a host plant, it means that the monarchs come and lay their eggs 
um, the caterpillars um, come out and they, they can eat, they've evolved with, with milkweed over time to be able to survive and eat the milkweed. And then you have the monarchs. Okay, so I just want to also mention that I have this in my yard and it's doing great in the dry weather. Yeah. Like, I have a really ridiculously dry garden. Yeah. And they're just happy about this good. much soil and rock. Yeah. <laughs> good. This is um, now just about to bloom. Okay. Everything's um, flying around it, but that's doing well. I know. Yeah, but they're blooming and they look beautiful. Um, so cardinal flower is one you can actually find at garden centers, but for some reason people don't plant it and don't talk about it. Um, we have it in yard in our yard. It's not blooming yet, but um, when it does, it is a fabulous host for hummingbirds. Um, so we will sit and watch and hummingbirds just like are constantly on it. And my kids have talked about wanting to do uh, a hummingbird feeder, like put a hummingbird bird feeder. But we have native honey uh, trumpet, uh, trump, uh, honeysuckle and the native card uh, cardinal flower. We really don't need um, to deal with washing and, and all that with the, the hummingbird feeders. So those are a few things and I'll, um, you don't have to like write all these down. I'll put these on our um, Mass our, uh, Wild Ones website, which is just masswildones.org. Um, and I'll send it to you guys as well if you want to share this. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we were, great. we were gonna send, the. this is all being recorded. So right. people can go back and zoom through it, you know, fast forward to what they want. But we'll also send a PDF of our presentations to people along with, link, with links to our sites and the information. I just want to give a plug for the false blue indigo. Yeah. I have that also blooming right now. Yeah. Beautiful plant, doesn't need anything. Uh, again, uh, other things dying around it right now, but this guy, yep. not a problem. <laughs> yep, I have, uh, I'd say 95% native plants in my yard and I, um, I, don't, I don't need to water. And I do love watering, so sometimes I'm like, <laughs> oh man, nothing to water, but, um, yeah, they're very easy. So mm -hmm. then, oh, sorry. Keep getting stuck here a little bit. Okay, so um, bee balm, Monarda fistulosa. There's um, several different Monardas. Um, fistulosa is supposed to do really well in a rain garden. Um, and um, it's a host to butterflies, um, swallowtails, sulfur skippers, and it's a larval host to several things. Um, and of course, it's um, great for bees. And that, and I should be telling you, sorry, that gets about three to four feet tall. Okay, so let's look at a few native plants for your part sun rain garden. So these are all lovely. And again, there's so many more options. I just picked 10 to start. So purple coneflower there on the bottom right. Um, four feet tall, uh, purple blooms in late summer. It's the host plant for silvery checker spot butterfly um, and an excellent nectar plant. And... Birds will come and visit this late fall um, and winter and eat the seed. So um, a lot of times we have um, all these wonderful plants with seeds and then we cut them down and compost that when it was really, it's bird seed, we're growing bird seed. Um, so leaving things up in the winter, like the purple cone flower. Okay, so this is Marsh Blazing Star. I mean, it gets two to four feet tall and it blooms in the summer. Um, it's commonly available in nurseries, and it's excellent for attracting pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, and honestly, it, it hosts so many things, I can't even list it because we'd be here for several minutes. But um, uh, it hosts so many things, and it, um, it hosts a caterpillar of a very rare, glorious flower moth. Okay, northern blue flag iris, iris versicolor. Um, it hosts 17 varieties of lepidop Lepidoptera, and it grows uh, two to three feet tall. Blue violet blooms in late spring. That's one other thing. If we can have blooms going through much of the year, um, that's really helpful for the pollinators. Okay, let's talk about. Oh, sorry. Okay, a few native plants for your shade rain, rain garden. So again, these are all wonderful. There's there's more, but let's talk about spice bush which is um, large, it'll grow six to 12 feet. It's a spring bloomer um, and it's a host for the spice bush swallowtail. And here's the caterpillar, spice bush swallowtail. Okay, and celandine poppy, 
um, is 12 to 20 inches tall, bright yellow blooms. Um, it's an early bloomer, so it's always nice to see that in early spring. Um, if you have something that looks like this in your yard, okay, these are the native wood poppy or celandine poppy. Um, pods. Those actually just matured and spread their seeds. If you have something that looks like the um, celandine poppy, but the seeds look like this, um, it's actually a non-native, really aggressive greater celandine. So, so pull that out um, and trash it if you have that. Um, and it's a great host plant for butterflies. Um, and then wild blue phlox, which is very easy to find at garden centers. It's very lovely. Um, 12 to 14 inches tall and um, blooms in the spring and it's a host to a number of things like the swallow um, swallowtails, hair streaks, um, its early blooms provide pollen and nectar um, and it's a host for the western pygmy blues. Whoops, okay. Um, so where to buy native plants and seeds? I find this um, a real challenge because um, I'll tell people, oh you should plant native and they're like, where do I buy those? And um, it's sometimes hard, you, you have to look. Um, and I have this up on the masswildones.org website, but there's a lot of great places for um, native seeds. Um, Wild Seed Project is one of my favorites um, out of Maine. Um, the second one, this Helia Native Nursery, um, on their website, they don't talk about how they have native seeds, but I have found if you call places that grow native plants, they will sell you native seeds. Um, there are two great places out of um, the Midwest, Prairie Moon Nursery, which is online, and Prairie Nursery, two separate things, which are lovely. Um, native plants, um, Garden in the Woods again in Framingham, they have uh, so many fabulous uh, native plants. They only sell native. Um, right now, they think they just opened back up um, for hikes, and if you go online, you can pre-order plants, and they'll have them ready for you to pick up. Um, there are other places, again, I'll have this on the website um, to get plants. And you can buy, some places do a great job of carrying large, big pots. You can buy a couple of, and some places like the Northeast pollinator plants do really well with um, buying flats of plugs of, say, like 36 of a kind of species if you have a large place. Um, Brett, can I ask you a question about yeah. places to buy? I found Kennedy's can be pretty good. Yes, that's coming up. Oh, good. Okay. okay. And, and there's a new, um, Hingham has a new uh, Weston. Weston's, yep. Yeah. So I have those on my list. Okay. Oh, so sorry. One, oh, no, that's good. Um, so one other place, um, my favorite place to buy native plants are just through annual native plant sales. Um, so Wild Ones, our chapter will have um, a native plant sale coming up. We're trying to decide. Um, I have, well, you may not be able to see out there, I have all my plants growing. <laughs> in my backyard um, to sell in a few months. The South Shore Natural Science Center does a great annual sale. I'm not sure if they're doing it this year though. Um, Grow Native Massachusetts is fabulous um, and Mass Audubon also does plant sales. All right, so local garden centers that carry native plants in addition to non-native plants. Um, so when I go to these places, so um, I'm far from a native plant expert, but um, I go and I bring my phone and I, I research. I'll find a plant I like and then I make sure it's native. Um, to my area. Um, so these are places we've heard have done well. I know I've been to Weston's and Sion's and Kennedy's um, and they all carry a lot of native plants. But again, you'll have to do your own research um, on what's native to your area. And then just one last little slide. Um, sorry, I'm going a little long here. Is um, a quick note about cultivars. So um, on the left here, you have a uh, common nine bark, which is a plant, um, a bush that is native to our area. And, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, fabulous, a fabulous bush that hosts um, many butterflies um, and pollinators. Um, people will, so basically cultivars are, are clones. Um, that's kind of simplistic in my explanation, but they'll take a cutting, a root cutting or stem cutting and make uh, another one. So it's like asexual propagation. Um, and so something you'll find at garden centers like this common nine bark Diablo. So if you find something in a garden center that has the single quote around it, it means that it's a cultivar. Um, and it's basically, um, so cultivars are basically clones of, of the parent plant. So these cultivars going out into the landscape are altering the genetic diversity of a species. Um, so there's basically zero genetic 
variability in clones. So if you can try to shop for the, the straight species, so common nine bark, not common nine bark Diablo or common nine bark Caputina. Um, I actually have Diablo in my yard. Um, I usually, I now only purchase straight species, but before I knew, um, I did buy this and it's basically like nothing's ever happening on it. Like nothing visits it. It's, it's pretty, um, but it really does nothing for environment. Um, and one other example of this is purple coneflower. Um, is such a fabulous pollinator plant, but purple coneflower, um, whoops, oh, the, in, the, in the quotes, the pink double is, uh, it doesn't, the, the pollinators can't get to the nectar. So um, if you can, if you're shopping in these places, try to avoid cultivars. And that's it. So thank you. But that was awesome. Thank Loved you. your presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. That was really good. And I, you know, I have to say, I never really understood about the cultivar. So thank you. That was really cool.